The film begins with a robot drone patrolling with its lens focused on the streets of a community in Baghdad. The citizens in the community rush to leave the vicinity, and the soldiers hurriedly surround the area where the explosives were reported to help the people evacuate. The robot drone is being maneuvered by three soldiers from the U.S. Army in charge of bomb disposal. The bomb disposal unit is led by Sergeant Thompson and his other teammates, Sergeant Sam Bourne and Sergeant Eldridge. The robot drone reaches a couple of sacks and closely inspects them, and there they see the bomb they need to detonate beneath the pile. Sergeant Eldridge attaches a small card at the back of the robot, which is again controlled to reach where the bomb is located. However, before it even goes back to the area, the wagon loses a wheel, which makes Thompson decide that he has to check the zone closely. His other teammates help him wear a thick bomb suit and walk toward the trailer. The other surgeons assist him as he goes close to the explosive. Sam Bourne observes the people from higher grounds through the scope of his rifle. Eventually, a guy approaches him and orders him to go out of the vicinity. He finally reached the small cart attached to the robot drone and went to the sack bag to place the explosives. Then he strolls back to his colleagues at medium speed. Meanwhile, Eldridge sees a man holding a phone a few meters away. He shouts and orders the man to drop the phone, but the man quickly dials the keypad, which makes the bombs explode. Thompson is unable to run fast enough to avoid its effect and eventually kills him with the loss of their comrade. Sandborn puts Thompson's belongings in a casket to be shipped to his home. Later, he returns to the base to meet the new leader of the bomb disposal unit, Sergeant William James. He is greeted by Loud Music and James' housing unit at their military camp. There, he welcomes the new leader to the Bravo Company. The next day, the unit goes to a new bomb disposal mission. As they reach their location, it looks like an abandoned city with narrow streets. The citizens are only inside their houses, watching the soldiers from their windows. Along the way, Sanborn communicates with the other unit that went before them. Using the radio, James sees the other EOD Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit's vehicle on the left side of the street, and the three of them detoured. James sees Carter, a member of the other EOD unit, and tells him that the bombs were 20 meters down the street. James wears the bulky protective gear for bombs and heads down the street. As he walks toward the area, he puts out a can and smoke starts coming out of it, making the visibility of his teammates weaker. He says that it is for diversion. Sanborn and Eldridge rush to see a clearer view, but the smoke is too thick. With another EOD unit down the street at the intersection, a car stops in front of him, and James points his gun at the driver. The soldiers surround the culprit and order him to get out of the vehicle. The man is stiff and refuses to move. Then James shoots two times at the side of the man's front wheels, then once again. Finally, he shoots the car's front window, puts the gun right on the forehead of the man, and commands him again to draw back the vehicle. Instead, the man approaches the other soldier, Sand immediately holds him down, arresting him. James continues to inspect the streets of the community. He finds something suspicious in the ground where the explosives are buried. A closer look. After cutting the wires of the bombs, he reports that the job is done. However, he notices a red wire buried in the ground and inspects it again. To his surprise, the wire leads to multiple other wires connected to seven more bombs. Meanwhile, the guy, secretly observing him on a high floor in one of the buildings, immediately finds his way down the building to escape. As James is busy cutting the bombs, he makes eye contact with the guy before detouring to another narrow street. After the mission, Eldridge, relaxingly, plays a video game when Cambridge joins him to ask about his condition. Cambridge questions his thoughts and Eldridge answers. Using his rifle, he drives fire at multiple times, implying that if he had just shot the man with a phone, Thompson would have been alive. At the same time, James is walking alone outside the military base when a child approaches him to buy DVDs. He agrees to buy with the child, who works for the merchant. After a short time of persuasion, the boy introduces himself as Beckham. Subsequently, the EO unit is deployed to another mission. They see the people quickly evacuating the building. James asks a guy about the situation and learns that a car was parked illegally near the United Nations building. James, while wearing a protective gear, approaches the vehicle. A guy hiding his face from a high building quietly observes and eventually shoots the car. He immediately runs in an attempt to escape. James gets the fire extinguisher from Sam Bourne to eradicate the fire, and he orders him to go to a higher position to observe. James inspects the car to search for the explosives. First, he looks at the trunk and finds multiple artillery shells. Then he removes his protective gear, claiming it would make him die comfortably. He persistently searches the car, tearing up the seats and looking through the floors, which takes several minutes of his time. Meanwhile, Eldridge notices a guy with a camera and warns Sanborn about it. James continues to explore the car to see the triggering wires. Sanborn keeps asking him through their communication device about his situation, which pisses him off and is why he throws it out. He then notices three men from a higher building and waves at them, but they do not respond. Finally, after some time, 
One of the guys waves his hand to communicate with the guy holding a camera. Simultaneously, James successfully finds the triggering devices, throws them, and calls the mission done. He returns to their EOD vehicle, where Sam Morn follows him and punches him for not acknowledging him during the mission. Shortly, Colonel Reed approaches him, who is impressed by his previous performance. He shakes James' hand and asks how many bombs he managed to disarm, to which he answers with an exact number of 873. The following day, his unit goes to a desert to detonate some explosives. As usual, momentarily, James says that he left his gloves near the blast zone and swiftly drives back there. Sanborn has the idea of igniting the bombs while James is down there, but Eldridge convinces him not to. On their way back, they pass through an SUV and a group of guys with covered faces. One man raises his hand, asking them to stop. Sanborn orders them to put down their weapons, which the men obey. One of the men reveals that they are on the same side and need help with their flat tire. Sanborn's unit agrees to help them and converse with them when the wrench man is suddenly shot in the back. To their surprise, multiple gunshots fire at their location, so they promptly find a place behind the rocks to defend themselves from the unknown gunners. Unfortunately, another man on the tank firing at the culprit is shot dead. The men aim at the building meters away to shoot down the enemies and a few moments later, another man from their team fired again. Sanborn targets the two men at the window, while James is looking through a telescope to guide Sanborn with a blurry visibility. Because of the scorching heat, Sanborn runs out of ammo, so James orders Eldridge to search for the bags. Unfortunately, the bullets are covered in blood, making Sanborn's rifle jam again. James asks Eldridge to clean off the ammunition by spitting and rubbing it. He continues to guide Sanborn in spotting the enemies. Seeing two enemies above the building, Sanborn immediately shoots them. Next, James sees a man meters away from the desert and points it out. He fires at the man and misses on the first try, then succeeds on the second time. They look again at the man peeping through the window and shoot at him, confirming to be dead promptly as his shoulder hangs out of the window. As a lookout, Eldridge notices a man sprawling near the tracks, far away from them and positioned at the back of James and Sanborn. He questions his comrades if he needs to shoot the man, to which James says it's his call, so he decides to open fire. James states that the encounter is finally over. As the sun begins to set back at their housing unit, the three of them celebrates with a couple of alcohol. It is noticeable how James and Sam Warren's relationship became more comfortable. Sam Warren sees James' possessions under his bed, including a photo of his son, some components from defused bombs, and his wedding ring. Shortly, the two take turns, pounding each other on the stomach as their way of bond and playing on their next mission. Colonel Cambridge assists them in going to a building. He stays outside the building, asking the residents to leave the vicinity. At the same time, James, Sanborn, and Eldridge make their way inside. As they walk, inspect the building, and cover each other's backs, they see several supplies of components to produce explosives. They also discover several pieces of evidence on their way that indicate the bombers just left the area. In one of the rooms covered in plastic curtains, James sees the boy covered in blood, lying on the platform, lifeless. He recognizes the boy as Beckham and orders Sanborn and Eldridge to leave the building. James looks upset, but he has to continue inspecting the boy's body. He opens the boy's stomach and finds explosives covered in plastic in the boy's abdomen. He envelopes the boy's lifeless body with a white blanket and gives it to the other men. At the same time, Cambridge continues to command the people to leave the area. James calls him to go back to their vehicle, but a bomb explodes in the area where Cambridge is situated. The colonel's helmet flies and they realize that he is dead, making Eldridge sorrowful. After another gruesome death and the morale being dragged down, James calls his wife. She answered the call while carrying the baby. After multiple times of saying hello, he ended the call without saying anything. The next day, James goes to the merchant with whom the boy works. He inquires about Beckham's situation, but the merchant says he cannot understand English. He thinks the merchant is suspicious and is probably giving intel to their enemies, and so he approaches the other soldier and tells him about his intuition, but the soldier says they are all clear. Later that day, when the merchant is packing up, he sneaks to follow him in his car and points a gun at his head, ordering him to drive instead. The merchant stops at a house where he goes in uninvited and defends himself with his pistol. He looks at the kitchen and sees an old man introducing himself as a professor. He investigates the old man about Beckham, but answers that he doesn't know the boy. The old man is surprisingly hospitable and even treats him as a visitor and wants him to sit with him. As they talk, James makes his conclusion that he is telling the truth. As he makes his way out, the man's wife catches him and is angry because of his intrusion. He hastily returns to the base while the other soldiers are pointing guns and lights at him. He lies about going to a whorehouse. That same night, he receives a call to check out a bomb blast zone. The people in that area are evacuating and some residents are severely injured. 
James continues inspecting the area with Sanborn following him, and concludes that it is a possible suicide bombing. However, James has a different theory that the bomber stayed away from the site and triggered the blast from a distance. With James' infuriated tone and eagerness to find the bomber, he asks Sanborn and Eldridge to search the streets separately. Moments after Sanborn and James hear gunshots from where Eldridge is, they quickly go there to see an unknown man lying on the ground, dead. They go straight down the narrow street and see Eldridge being dragged by two men. They follow the men and shoot them as soon as they see them. To their surprise, James unintentionally shot Eldridge in the leg, injuring him. The following day, the two meet Eldridge at the helicopter that will evacuate him and bid goodbye. Beckham approaches James but ignores him after realizing he is alive. On their next duty, Sanborn and James discern a guy with explosives attached to his body, and the soldiers surround him. One of the soldiers suggests shooting him, but the other says he's a family man and needs to be rescued. He walks towards the man, learning that the bomb is timed only for two minutes. The family man is scared and begs for mercy, so James is given shears to cut the metal locks. Unfortunately, they are too solid and many. With 45 seconds left, Sanborn tells him to go, as it is impossible to disarm the bomb with this solid conviction. To save the man's life, he refuses Sanborn's command. He tries to cut the locks one more time, but eventually realizes he cannot do it. He can only apologize to the man and runs away. The bombs blast off, throwing James because of the impact and killing the man on their way back. Sanborn acknowledges the danger and pressure of their work, saying that he is afraid of death. He worries that he will die without starting a family himself. Hearing this, James tries to comfort and assure him that he can make it back home. As the team rotation ends, James is given time to return home and spend time with his family. However, he finds it strange to live simply, such as needing to decide which cereal to pick, as there are various options. He even has a conversation with his infant child, saying that as his child grows older, some things you used to love would not be so special anymore. In the end, James decides to go back Toto, continue his job at the bomb disposal unit. The movie's final scene shows that he becomes a part of a different unit team and transitions to wearing a suit, continuing his passion for detonating bombs and saving lives.